and welcome to January 2019 uh, in terms of the Anthony Peake Consciousness Hour. Uh, I'm intrigued by the fact uh, that when you get to my age, you realize that you're actually living in a science fiction world because the actual concept of 2019 just seems so completely and utterly strange. And I think I read recently that 2019 was when Blade Runner um, was supposed to be based. It could have been 2018, but I suspect it's 2019. So here we are living in, the, in a real future world. We don't necessarily have um, anti-gravity cars and everything else, but we, what we do have is the most amazing informational change and in the way in which we're living in a world of information. And indeed, information is going to be one of the areas we're going to be talking about with today's guest, who is somebody I've been looking forward to speaking to for a long time. Uh, it's Dr. Jude Curavan. Now, Jude is the third of a trilogy of um, PhDs we've had on the program. We'd had Dr. Imance Barus on in November. We had uh, Dr. Julia Mossbridge on in December. And now we have Dr. Jude Curavan. And I feel that very much this trilogy works very, very well because it's it's all building up a picture. It's all adding color to um, a very, very interesting image of exactly how the world is and how the world is developing. So I'm not sure that many of you out there will already know of Jude's absolutely fantastic work, um, but I'll just give you a little bit of background to her in terms. And uh, Jude Curavan is a cosmologist, planetary healer, futurist and author. She's a Master of Physics from Oxford University, specializing in quantum physics and cosmology, and a PhD in archeology span from the University of Reading in the UK, researching ancient cosmologies. Until the mid 1990s, a corporate career culminated in her being the CFO of two major international companies and one of the most senior business, senior business women in the UK. With extensive experience and knowledge of world events, international politics, global economic financial systems and future trends, she's a sought after speaker on the transformation reforms in the UK, US, Europe, Japan and South Korea. She has traveled to nearly 80 countries, worked with wisdom keepers from many traditions and is a lifelong researcher into the scientific and experiential understanding of the nature of reality and consciousness. The author of six books, her latest is the 2017 and Silver Nautilus award-winning The Cosmic Hologram, Information at the Center of Creation. She's a member of the Evolutionary Leaders Circle, and in 2017, she co-founded The Whole Worldview. Now, why I'm excited about talking to Jude is that we have um, incredibly similar backgrounds in many ways. Um, I suspect from Jude's background, from what I've read up about her background, she's, she's from the northeast of England, she's from a mining family, which gives her fairly strong working class credentials, as well as, as interesting other credentials. And I'm exactly the same. I'm from the northwest, Jude is from the northeast. But we both have had these dual careers within business and within um, more interesting areas of esoterica. Uh, because I work as a, many of you will know, I work as a management consultant. Co uh, I'm, a, I'm a compensation and benefits analyst and a supposedly a compensation and benefits expert. And company call upon my experience to help them set up where the comp and bend structures. Jude has done it even greater than I have in the sense that she, she has the background in science. Uh, I'm a frustrated physicist in many ways because I did very much social science at university. But Jude has done the science and she's done also the archaeology. So it's fascinating to actually have the knowledge of physics, the knowledge of quantum physics, and then apply that to ancient cosmologies. So the area she's working in is fantastic. And I strongly advise if anybody wants to read a book in the next few weeks, The Cosmic Hologram, Information at the Center of Creation is an absolutely wonderful read. Jude takes you through an incredibly systematic, simple and fun way through some very, very deep and meaningful concepts about what the true nature of reality is. Um, absolutely wonderful book and I strongly advise it. Also, Jude um, uh, is working with something called the Unity Conference, um, and I attended the last meeting that Jude facilitated um, together with um, Lord Stone of Blackheath um, in uh, the, uh, the Parliament area in London. Um, and we've got another conference uh, this coming Thursday, which I'm hoping to attend once I get my finger out and get my details. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to get into the house, uh, the, the, the Palace of Westminster. But I'm looking forward to that as well. So, Jude, without further ado, uh, welcome to uh, the Consciousness Hour. <laughs> Thank you so much. I love, I love that. You, yeah, you've got to let us know because the security guards won't let you in otherwise. <laughs> And I know that because I'm quite a suspicious looking character, so it's highly likely. To <laughs> I'll put in a good word for you, but... Oh, thank you. That, that makes, makes me feel a lot better. It really does. 
Okay, Jude, can you just tell us, one of the things I keep doing when I'm interview interviewing you as well, and we're a similar age, we're of a similar generation, and every time I say, hey, Jude, or hi, Jude, like the Beatles resonate with me <laughs> all your life, you know, it's, and, and as somebody from Merseyside, it particularly uh, it just amuses me in many, many ways. But can you tell me a little bit about your background? Because clearly your, your background makes you, makes you who you are and the special person you are. So can you tell us a little bit about how your career has developed over the years and then we'll get into the more meaty areas. Well, thank you. I, I mean, I tend to describe it rather than a career, a scenic route. Um, it's rather like those, you know, the, 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 the sort of the headwaters of, of a river and all the tributaries and, and finally they interweave and you, you get some sense that the river's going somewhere. But certainly in the early and, and mid ranges of that, you're not quite sure where the path is, is, is going, but you, you show up. And for me, that, that my, my sort of way shower throughout my entire life has been a curiosity from the very get-go. Um, my mother was a saint because I was starting to ask why and how is things as they are, literally, from, she told me, from the age of, of two. Um, and she was wonderful because instead of trying to close that down, she just nurtured that curiosity and just helped me real point in the right you know the, the ongoing direction so you my my dad was a coal miner um i grew up in the north of england um in chesterfield which is not quite up in the northeast no it's no. not it's, I, I <laughs> <laughs> but um but the thing i would say is that i started to experience multi-dimensional realities when i was four years old um i started having precognitive dreams i was having telepathic communications um, I was having out-of-body experiences. I was literally walking between worlds. Can you expand upon that? I, I watched your wonderful talk that you gave at Findhorn recently, a couple of days ago, which you kindly sent to me. And you mentioned this, this kind of, um, your experience of what you call the supernormal as yeah. a child. Can you expand a little bit? Because you mentioned precognitive experiences, out-of-body experiences. I'd be really interested to know a little bit more about that because I'm very intrigued about um, unusual experiences in young children uh, and in my last book I focused in on it and I'll be focusing even more in my next book so I'm very interested in how it started and how you interpret it as a child. Well I think first of all I'd query the point about there being unusual experiences. I think the more that you know we don't shut down children and you know our society has been very good for a long time at really, you know, the, the mainstream paradigm of a materialistic reductionist worldview that of course has been the mainstream view of science until really now. Um, so I think a lot of children have the sort of experiences that I had. Um, I think where I perhaps differed is I didn't tell anybody about them. It didn't even occur to me, it wasn't that I was afraid at that age of what people might say, but I had there was no urge for me to share those at a young age or when I was growing up. And I didn't start to share these experiences until I was in my late 30s, early 40s. And so I never got shut down. And I know my mum wouldn't have done that, but I suspect that friends might have, school teachers might have, you know, a lot of other people in, in the environment that I grew up with would have said, oh, that's nonsense. But for me, those experiences was real as, as anything we call phys the physical realm. And the other thing that really um, inspired me and really helped me was that they were answering questions of my curiosity that I was then able to check out. But I was getting information, you know, we talk about information and, you know, what you'll perhaps go on to explore is how our universe is innately and non-locally interconnected, you know, beyond um, a space time, and that we have access to that understanding. And so I was just experiencing that from a very early age and never stopped experiencing it. So all my life, it's been an incredibly enriching, multidimensional way of me garnering information. And of course, it's what the mystics of all traditions have done from perhaps the beginning of, of the human journey. It's what many, many leading scientists have actually done. 
in the sense of that intuitive, that that beyond the sort of the here and now, whether through dreams, so many scientists talk about, you know, the insights that come to them from dreams. And that's happened to me as well. And then they've had to prove it. They've had to say, ah, now how does this work? But the dreams have been the portal to understanding that wasn't available into what I think Maslow called this sunlit consciousness. You know, higher levels, higher realms of awareness and intuitive insights. And for me, you know, telepathy and precognitive perspectives um, are just part of what you would, you know, you call, and I call, and, and Dean Radin of IONS calls, supernormal phenomena. They're not paranormal, they're not supernatural, but they're supernormal in the sense that they're extraordinary and not part necessarily of our everyday experiences, although to me they are. What kind of um, experiences did you have in this regard, in terms you mentioned you had precognitive experiences? Would you care to share with us, because to me one of the greatest proofs, I think, if we never talk about proofs in terms of, you know, empirical proofs, and of course empirical from experiences, when we have these on these experiences that fly in the face of what normal materialist reductionist science say about the, the nature of reality, the nature of time. So you at a very young age obviously had validation from a series of experiences of precognition. Um, could, you, could you tell us maybe just one short example of how that was with you as a child? Yeah, or not necessarily as a child, because when I remember about 15 years... Can you spare with me one second? I've left my heater on and I just want to turn it off. So. <laughs> okay. Okay, sorry, I'm back with you. My apologies. No worries at all. Um, well, first of all, I, I, I'd just like to say a little bit about the nature of time, and perhaps we could go back to discussing yes, more detail. Absolutely. Because what I've done in the Cosmic Hologram, I've, I've restated the laws of physics essentially as, as algorithms of information. And in doing that, I've been able to show um, how our universe could be co-created by cosmic mind. So... We'll get into that, I hope. Okay. For me, time is real. You know, we often hear that time's an illusion, but time within space-time, we wouldn't have any sort of consensual understanding, in my perspective, of the nature of physicalized reality in our universe, unless time flowed. Yeah, from 13.8 billion years ago, every moment and, and onwards. But also our universe is, is non-locally interconnected at the most foundational level so that within space-time, signals can't go faster than the speed of light. But we do have access on a simultaneous level to that understanding that is part of supernormal phenomena. So for me, precognition isn't that the future's already written. But what experimentalists are finding, and this is my own experience, is there's almost a bow wave that is, that is the future crystallizing as it moves into the present. And Dean Radin's found this in experiments where people are, are, are subliminally aware of something that's going to show up on a computer screen before it shows up. It's a very short time frame. Some more sensitive folks seem to be able to, to sort of read that crystallizing bow wave a bit further down the line. Yeah. So my precognition has been limited to probably no more than a week. And I've spoken with other people who feel further out, but I also feel we have to be very careful because it's about testing that precognition. And when somebody says, oh, I see a thousand years ahead, there's no way of testing that. So for me, as both a mystic and a scientist, I say that's really interesting that you mentioned the word empirical. So the story I'll, I'll share is when about 15 years ago, I had a dream of there being an incredibly cold day. And at the time of the dream, the weather was quite mild and there was no forecast of snow or ice or anything, but I had this dream. And in the dream, I looked out of my kitchen window and someone came through the gate in, in, in a, a red coat. I noticed the red coat. And as they walked towards me, they slipped and fell. I thought, oh no, and then I woke from the dream. A week later, that exact same thing happened. There was very heavy snow, very heavy ice. Somebody who I didn't know, who I'd never met before, 
came through the garden gate and as they walked to the house in a red coat they slipped and fell and I couldn't do anything about it and what I started to wonder at that point was what's the difference between precognition and an occasion where people have seen the future or perceived the future and changed what they were able to do about it and there are quite a lot of those and it seems that there's sometimes when one can and sometimes when one can't but in my case in that precognitive experience I just had to look in horror as this poor woman slipped over and unfortunately didn't do a lot of damage but I, it was like I couldn't do anything about it. That's very <laughs> That's fascinating, and I'm particularly delighted that you mentioned the work of Dean Radin on this, because Dean Radin's work has long fascinated me. It was the, the work he did with Dick Beerman, I think. That's right. And the idea that we have, we have, we are able in some way to monitor the, our own immediate future in some way, in, in terms of anticipating, and our body anticipates it as well. It's the body, which I thought was really powerful with that yeah. experimentation, that it wasn't the, it wasn't the cognitive mind, it was the way the body responded to images before they were actually shown on the screen. Mm, and the way in which it, the, the electrolysis of the skin right. and, and, ducts and ductions changed. And I was also intrigued by the work, there's a guy called Dylan Haynes, who you're probably aware of, that's doing a lot of experimental work in the Netherlands in the terms of it's going back almost to the the intention to flex ideas of of people like uh, oh the name is escaped me now but a series of, of of experiments that were done in the 1980s 1990s whereby you know that you could do brain scans and the brain would anticipate sets of circumstances before they happen suggesting in some way that consciousness or conscious awareness or whatever we call conscious awareness sort of sits slightly behind external stimuli and if the body the body has its automatic processes that it works with now your your concept there of the the bow wave i think is fascinating because again it reinforces the work of people like uh the top-down hypothesis of um of uh, stephen hawking and the idea that in some way time time can be anticipated and there's potential and also Kramer I think John Kramer came up with his transactional analysis of quantum physics so there's an awful lot of powerful information from cosmology and from particle physics on this that that we can in some way see the future and perceive the future but my question on that one is and it is always intriguing and I'm interested in your opinion on this is why is it that only certain incidents seem to to resonate from the future, like your incident with the, the lady falling over with the red dress. Why do certain things are imbued with meaning that we, we can sort of future remember them, whereas other incidents that are world cataclysmic events, we don't tend to remember. Have you any thoughts on why that might be? I do. I think there's some experimental support for this in the sense that first of all the Gansfeld experiments that, that are, are very you know wide ranging suggest that when someone is in a sort of sense of alertness then there's that receptivity opens up to a wider field of, of potential information so hence dream time hence you know just that gen you know that the relaxed alertness but Stephen Schwartz has done a lot of work on this and suggests that there's also, there's, like, there's two aspects. There's both the receptor and there's the event of, of what is unfolding that is being witnessed. And the event that's being witnessed seems to be more powerfully communicated when there's a level of dyn dynamism to it, wow. a sense of sort of entropic, you know, informational entropy. There's a lot of information there, a lot might be happening, and it has some personal meaning to the receptor wow. receiver. and there's something in that i think because all information is essentially relational mm -hmm. so it seems that the the, the the sort of the alertness of the potential receiver and the dynamism of the of the, the message as it were seems to have that greater resonance and i think that's what dean's found as well he's found that that you know that 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 short sort of bow wave perception of the body is more noticeable when the image that then comes up on the screen is one that's more emotive um, you know negative or positive but there's more sort of informational entropy informational content and it has more meaning it has more sort of emotional meaning to the receiver. 
Of course, yeah, it's quite interesting here because I've, I've checked out quite a few of your, your talks and things and you talk a great deal and you write very eloquently about the whole issue of entropy and information and how everything, when it's boiled down to, is, is, is digital information that we're actually perceiving in some way, that reality is, is a kind of, a, it's digital and there's a baseline of consciousness. And what our brain does, it, it, it takes that information and creates the world around us. But before I move on to that, one of the, um, the sections that I read in your, your book and in one of your papers really got me up and made me jump back. And I was so excited when I discovered it because I've long been fascinated by the experimentation that's being done in terms of superposition and, uh, and uh, action at a distance. And I was aware of the work that was being done by um, uh, the guy in, in, in uh, Innsbruck, um, who gave a game, again, name again has escaped me at the moment, um, and the idea of, of the way in which uh, particles, when they're entangled, can communicate instantaneously. Mm -hmm. uh, Anton Zeilinger, that's it. Yeah, and I was going to say, I think it was Zeilinger, yeah. And Zeilinger's <laughs> done a lot of experiments, as he did experiments on the Great Wall of China, and he did experiments in the Canary Islands. But you came up with this amazing piece of information, which I've now subsequently checked up, that they've now been able to, to experimentally show that you could go back six, six million light years 600 light years. 600, sorry, 600 light years. It's sorry. still a big number. <laughs> it's huge, isn't it? Yes. And the implications for that are just simply mind-blowing. It means that everything is, is unitary. Now, going on from that then, can you explain, because you do it so wonderfully, and if anybody, yours is the best book I've seen on explaining exactly why there is a belief that this is some form of simulation and it's some form, it's run on digital information. So could you share with us for a few minutes, I know it's a massive ask, but just to explain to the audience there, why people like myself are so enthusiastic about this principle and how you as, as somebody trained in quantum physics, trained in cosmology, how you as, as a professional scientist find this idea very interesting and very beguiling. Well, I think I do because I've followed where the evidence leads. And what we're finding across all scales of existence and many, many different fields of research, which, as you know, is, is in the book, is this, this, this underlying um, patterning of information is coming out time and time again. And basically, we, we need to take a lot of threads on this. But essentially, when we drill down into the, the so-called physical nature of reality, we know as physicists that it's incredibly ephemeral. But in the last few years, very clever experimenters have been able to show that digitized information, exactly the same that's you know, helping us communicate now, the ones and zeros digitized information of our technologies, is exactly the same as universal information, which is being seen to be more fundamental than energy and matter and, and space and time. And the experimenters have been showing that those digitized bits of information are every bit as physical as anything we call energy and matter. And what, we've, what they've done and what we've done is when you drill down into the basic laws of physics, something pops out that at first glance is extraordinary, but it shows how everything can then start to be pulled together. And that's the, the most fundamental scale of, of our universe is not the quantum scale. That's massive compared to the scale that literally pops out when you put all the forces of nature together. And that fundamental scale is named after Max Planck, who was one of the great pioneers of physics. And Max Planck actually said that in his view, what was primary was consciousness, and that consciousness essentially co-created the appearance of our universe. And when we drill down and, and find this fundamental scale of reality called the Planck scale, it's minute. It's as small compared to the quantum scale as the quantum scale is to the whole universe. And it is tiny in terms of its duration of time. But what it's showing us is that our universe or the appearance of our universe is pixelated, just as a computer screen is pixelated. Um, at that scale, that tiny, tiny scale, and at that tiny Planck scale, there's one bit of digitized information at every tiny scale, every tiny area of that scale. But you know, if I look at our, our computer screens or our best holograms, 
the Planck scale is a trillion, trillion times smaller than that. It's like, it's just incredible. But from that pixelation of space and time or consciousness, the appearance of our universe emerges. And we're finding that to be the case empirically now more and more. So essentially our universe exists and evolves as a unified entity. You mentioned the 600 light years. Well, for quantum physics to work at all, for the laws of physics to work at all, our universe does have to be intricately, foundationally interconnected on a non-local basis. That's the framework. But initially, scientists were saying, well, it, it really can't be this, even though it is, and the quantum experiment showed it to be the case. They then took elements bigger than the quantum scale to the scale of small diamonds and found that it still worked, non-local connectivity. And then most recently, astronomers been able to entangle starlight from stars 600 light years away with photons of light in the laboratory. And if it goes out 600 light years, there's nothing to show that it, it isn't the whole universe. And what I've done in the book and what evidence is now coming up is that it makes eminent sense for our universe to exist and evolve as a unified entity. And an entity of consciousness. You know, Sir James Jean said, what, a century ago? Our universe is more like a great thought than a great thing. That's what we are now discovering experimentally at all scales of existence. And latterly, we've actually found the signature of what I'm calling the cosmic hologram of this great thought within what's called the cosmic microwave background, which is the relic from that first few hundred thousand years after the, the, the birth of our universe, when we analyze that radiance, that relic radiation from the beginning of our universe, we find the same patterns, fractal patterns of information throughout the whole of space as we do when we look at the way electrons cluster, the way cities form, the way people work with the internet, literally across all scales and not just of the natural world, but of our human behaviors we're finding the same informational, relational patterns playing out. Our literary, our universe exists to evolve. That's what we're finding. There's this incredible evolutionary impulse that from the way our universe was created in that first moment, all the way through its life cycle, these patterns, these informational, dynamic, evolutionary patterns of consciousness. Because I'm, I'm intrigued. One of the sections that you write is something I've been fascinated for many, many years, the cosmic anthropic principle. Yeah. And the idea that it seems that either we argue that you go towards the ever its many worlds interpretation and you argue that every wave function, every outcome of every wave function collapse actually doesn't collapse and different universes are created to accommodate the, the actions of consciousness on subatomic particles. But we also have the issue that if we had only one singular, if we've only, the universe has only ever existed once, the idea that it managed to, to create everything in the way it did is just simply fascinating. You know, and I, I notice you cite um, the, is it, is it the seven easy, these are the seven numbers. Um, and the idea that there are these seven things that really suggest that this universe has, has, has a, a kind of, it, it has a teleological purpose to it. It's not just aimlessly exploring. It's as if, it's if the universe has evolved consciousness within itself in order to become self-aware of the fact of what it is. Now, again, I'm fascinated a little bit for you to just share with us a little bit about some of these cosmic anthropic principles, because I know there'll be a lot of listeners out there that won't have necessarily joined the dots on this as to just how incredible it is that Jude Curovan Anthony Peake and Dia Nunes are actually existing as conscious beings and sharing ideas. So if you could just a little, there's a little bit because this question is just so fascinating. It's mind blowing. It makes you sit back and go, do you know? I never it is, isn't it? It, it, it is. It is. It's, it's, 
I mean, it's been wowing for me since I was four years old and continues to wow for me. I mean, just to sort of perhaps set the scene, cosmologists now, more and more evidence is coming forward that our universe is finite, both in space and time. The best evidence we have is that it began 13.8 billion years ago and that it may actually only last for another tens of billions of years. And there's evidence for that that I lay out in the book. But the point is, it didn't begin as a big bang, which I, I heard a, a, an interview you gave recently where you quite rightly said it wasn't big and it wasn't a bang. And I got that from you. <laughs> I did get that from you. That was you. That was the sort of talk I'd seen you do. And I thought it was such a wonderful thing, but I should have acknowledged it. So my next time I do, it should be copyrighted because I think that is wonderful. <laughs> That's wonderful. Oh, bless you. But what it was, I described as the big breath. And this also relates to ancient wisdom. You know, the, the, um, the Vedic um, wisdom of ancient India talks about the, 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 the breath of Brahman. So what we find is when we go back 13.8 billion years, our universe, began, our universe began its smallest state, not infinitely small, but as a finite small state, but incredibly fine-tuned. I mean, Lee Smolin at the Perimeter Institute in, in um, Ontario put together the sort of the physics and the relationships between the various physical constants. And he basically came with a perspective that if the physical constants were different, and it's initially six numbers, six main numbers, not the seven, but six main numbers. If they were different from what they actually are, by one, in, by, by one part in 10 to the 27, that's one, that's one followed by 27 zeros, we wouldn't be here. The universe wouldn't have even got going. It also began in its simplest state. So in effect, it's not been moving from order to disorder, no. but simplicity to complexity ever more informational content. That's what evolution's about. And the other things that we find, for example, is that it's so exquisitely related. So space we know is geometrically flat because otherwise, and this is, this is me going full nerd, E wouldn't equal MC squared. We wouldn't have three dimensions that we experience as, as X, Y, and Z. But it's flat to the point experimentally shown of 10 to the 62, which again is one followed by 62 zeros. This is not just flat, this is flat. So what we find is that there's an incredible order, there's an incredible um, specialness about our universe. So in terms of those interpretations that you mentioned, um, rather than the Everett's one, which, which is, it fails something called Occam's Razor's Test, which is, you probably know, is that it's as simplest as it can be, but no simpler. But choose the simplest solution. Don't overcomplicate it. Because whenever we look at nature, nature emerges complexity from the simplest of rules. So what's now coming more and more forward is that the cosmos, cosmic mind, God, is infinite and eternal. But just as thoughts arise in our consciousness, so universes are thoughts within the mind of the cosmos. So whereas the cosmos is eternal and infinite, universes more and more have been perceived as being finite. And just after he died, Stephen Hawking co-authored a paper with a Belgian cosmologist called Thomas Hertog last year, in which they postulated our universe essentially as a cosmic hologram and as a finite thought form. And that was about a year after the book came out. So more and more the direction of travel is that, you know, our universe is a great thought, a great finite thought, and a great thought of the mind of the cosmos. For everything, consciousness isn't something we have, it's what we in the whole world are. Does that so that's, uh, make that's perfect because it gets around the whole question of Cartesian duality, the idea that, you know, that there's kind of this kind of thought something and there's physical something, but effectively almost like going back down to the non-dualistic beliefs of a lot of Eastern religions. It's non-dual. It's a single, it's a single thing. And that's consciousness. Exactly. Now, what, what intrigues me about all this as well is how the way in which 
we seem to be moving towards complexity in one way, from chaos to complexity. But of course, that runs counter to the second law of thermodynamics, which means the opposite should take place. So we have these two counter things taking place, don't we? And what's your interpretation of that? And how do you think that is happening? Oh, I love that question. And for me, we don't have two different things taking place. We need to probably go back to Ludwig Boltzmann, who in the 19th century started to look at the behavior of gases. And he came up with a concept, or around that time, this concept of entropy arose. And at its, at its most basic, the entropy of a gas is the number of microstates. And in a closed system, the number of microstates always increases through time. So for example, if you have a closed box, yeah, just sitting there, and energy can't go in or can't go out, the number of mm -hmm. its microstates always increases. And people interpreted mm -hmm. that for a long time as order to disorder, yeah? But actually, it is an order to disorder. And what we're realizing now is the entropy of a system is more appropriately a measure of its informational content, okay? So when you get a situation which has been, you know, we, we, we say, well, look, okay, our universe has started really simply. Since then, it's been becoming ever greater complexity. But what happens to a human body? Because we come in, we're born as a baby, we grow, we die. So if we look at entropy as this idea of order to disorder, you can argue that when we die, we become more disordered. Our bodies fall apart, we go back to the ground, all the rest of it. But instead, if you say, well, look, from the very get-go, from that first moment of space and time, the information content of our universe has continued to increase, yeah? The universe holds more information or, or there's more informational content now than there was yesterday. There'll be more informational content of our universe tomorrow than there is today. But when you bring consciousness into this, you realize that that informational content can become coherent it actually, in a human body, it can become coherent. So when we go back to the very beginning of space-time, when all there was, was was hydrogen, tiny bit of helium, minute bit of lithium, everything was set up so those hydrogen atoms could come together to form stars and galaxies. Two generations of stars going through their life cycle, using their hydrogen fuel to create helium and then heavier elements when they died and exploded if they were massive stars which those early stars were all those elements went out into the interstellar medium eventually they found birthing fields of carbon and nitrogen and oxygen that actually were the birthing fields of solar systems like ours and planets like ours and those planets when they were rocky were able to be you know, able to, to have biology, that the biological entities were able to evolve. So our entire universe, from hydrogen to people, has been moving from simplicity to complexity, rather than order mm -hmm. to disorder. And in that complexity, self-aware beings, as far as we have any sense, tend to find homes and evolutionary nurturing places to evolve such as Earth. It doesn't mean that the whole of space is complex, but it means that on planets like ours, our homes for our universe's evolutionary impulse to continue to move forward. So we need to see our universe literally almost as a universe soul, you know, that was born 13.8 billion years ago with all the instructions how to make a perfect universe. It had all the instructions, maybe from many, 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 many different iterations of earlier universes. As if we were in a, an infinite and eternal cosmos, there's no rush. But 13.8 billion years ago, the great thought of our universe came into being to the point that self-aware beings such as ourselves, and likely on many, many different planets, are having these conversations and able to actually consensually realize this great story 
of, of reality, this great story, this great adventure of evolution. And for me, that's not a simulation. That is universal consciousness. That is, that is cosmic consciousness, co-creating these opportunities to experience and explore. What is that's wonderful amazing. here is that you're very much putting the science to the writings of Morris Book all those years ago in cosmic consciousness, you know, from what, 115 years ago. And I'm, I'm also fascinated by, and you, you put that wonderfully, by the way, I could listen to you for hours. You just put that so wonderfully. Your, your gift of, of putting concept, co complex ideas in a way that a lay person can understand is profoundly important because we are dealing with very, very esoteric subjects here. We're talking about Shannon's concept of information. We're talking about whether information can generate energy in some way. But as a billion dollar question, if we consider that the universe is an enclosed system, and I know that one of the major arguments in the holographic argument is that you can't lose energy and information. So if you systematically threw computers into a black hole, effectively the universe would lose information. And I know the argument is that the information is smeared around the edges yeah. of that. But effectively, whereas if we are an enclosed system and, and information is energy, where is the energy coming from within an enclosed system to, to be adding to the complexity of what effectively should be a system that should be in balance, if, if that's making sense? It, it makes eminent sense, and, and indeed that's the case. Um, if you look at the, the, the energy and matter of, of our universe, it is conserved for the full life cycle of our universe. So the energy matter that was there at that first moment of space-time wow. is now that will be to the end it's just changed its form so right. forces and energy can be both negative and positive and they balance out that's the point so what we have is a situation where information can express itself in complementary ways as energy and matter which is the restatement of the first law of thermodynamics which is the energy mm -hmm. of a closed system is always stays you know, it's always conserved it doesn't increase or reduce it just changes its form. When we take that forward with all the cosmological understanding we have now and the informational basis, we can restate that law as the information expressed as the energy matter of our universe is always concerned. But there are two laws of thermodynamics and going back to this simple but no simpler, why are the two laws of thermodynamics? Well, if there was just the first law, that the information expressed as energy matter of our universe was always conserved. There'd be no notion of time. Our universe would exist, but it couldn't evolve. But if you then take the second law, which is this whole thing about entropy, the entropy of a closed system always increases through time. We can finally restate that as information entropically expressed as the space time of our universe always increases a term, how your evolves. a term you use a lot a term you use a lot here is the term information and i know a lot of people will get confused now i'm aware of where you're going with that but effectively it's important to differentiate between information and information i know it's very much from david bone but could yeah. you explain a little bit what what you mean by information rather than just pure information yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned David Byrne because he was a real, a real pioneer and, and he died, he passed in 1992. So I hope he'd be very happy now because his insights are now being able to be empirically proven. And by restating the laws of thermodynamics as laws of infodynamics, which is what I've done in, in the book, his insights can really now lift off. And the difference between information and information is the difference between um, letters of the alphabet and words. So if we think, well, if, go back a second. If we think of digitized information, the ones and zeros, we can describe any object in terms of a long string of ones and zeros. So the ones and zeros are essentially the alphabet of the universe. But if they were creating nonsense, you know, A, B, C, Ds just could create gobbledygook or they could create poetry. The digitized information, the two letter alphabet of our universe, 
patterns, patterns itself in meaningful in dash formation. And it's that meaningful relational dynamic in formation that makes up the meaning and essentially purpose and the patternings and the planets and stars and leaves and Antony's and all of it of our universe. It's not random data. And in fact, the latest research, I've always said randomness doesn't exist. And it's really interesting because a lot of biological researchers are now showing that the appearance of randomness is hiding underlying non-randomness. Yeah. And that's why people also don't tend to talk about chaos theory anymore. They talk about complexity theory. Because there's this realization that there is deep meaning and purpose um, in a, of our universe, and that's why I use the term in formation and not just in formation. So, what is this telling us about the human condition and the observational universe we exist within that's, that we receive through our senses? What you're suggesting here is that there is definitely underlying patterns. There's definitely underlying intention of an evolving universe. What, where, do, where do you think, what do you think we're ultimately going to discover about the true nature of what is going on? Have we any idea the great mysteries of, of, of what we are, what we're here for, where we're going, which are the great questions? Because also as somebody interested in mysticism, these are things that must be profoundly huge questions. And I know it's, again, I keep asking you massively, Difficult questions because it, it, it underlies so many things. But I know that people who will be listening to this will be going, wow, 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 this is such exciting stuff. But what's it for? Because people will always ask, what are things for? Why are so, this way? Why? I've, well, it's been the question I've been asking, as I mentioned, you know, all my life. Um, the way, for me, the way our universe is co-created by, I'll call cosmic mind, which is, is perhaps the most neutral, but great mystery, God, Allah, you know, whatever great spirit, whatever term we want to use for an infinite, eternal, ineffable ground of being. Yeah? If we sense that our universes, our great thoughts from that infinite ground of being, then for me, I've always wanted to understand, well, why is our universe set up as it's set up? And you mentioned non-duality. And all mystics of all ages and spiritual seekers have sought to connect with that underlying non-duality, that, that nirvana, that ineffable, that luminosity, that blissful state of, of no beingness that is all beingness. And yet, unless that is differentiated, we cannot experience what that might mean. Unless non-duality is differentiated into the appearance of duality we can't have this conversation i can't find out more about myself and ask those questions of who am i where am i coming from where am i going what's all this about so the the issue i think we've got as as a human species is that we've mistaken the differentiation of non-duality into the appearance of duality to a conviction of separation. So we've lost that, that grounding of oneness and oneness expressed, unity expressed in radical diversity. We sort of, as a collective, perhaps misunderstood and, and now we've sort of gone into this disappearance of separation. I think what now though is so exciting for me and I think Dia referred to this before we came sort of on air, is that it's such a pivotal moment when we're in this potential breakdown and breakthrough. And breakdown is really, you know, we've got to this point of potential breakdown because of our mistaken, limited worldview and the appearance of separation. We literally are now remembering the wholeness and re-understanding that instead of separation, our universe is a diverse expression of non-duality that enables it and us and to experience and to evolve. 
it's almost as if the universe itself is becoming self-aware of the fact and through us and through our acts of observation our acts of creation are creating everything around us now i know that you're involved in some very exciting projects i know that you and i will be meeting again on thursday at the unity conference uh, which was being facilitated by you and uh, individuals such as uh, Lord Stone of Blackheath. Could you tell the listeners and the watchers, I never know we call them listeners or watchers or, or whatever we call friends. them. Friends. We call them friends. friends. <laughs> so many friends out there. Hi, friends. You know, Hi, friends. It sounds like, God, I was I thinking for some, I was sounding like Tommy Cooper for a second. <laughs> a lot of the American listeners won't get that one, by the way, at all. But... Um, the unity conference itself what are the overall guiding principles because i was amazed you know because you said when you did your your introductory talk last time we all met up and you said just speak to the people next to you because there are so many fascinating people here and over coffee i got chatting to a guy and he gave me his card and his name was richard olivier and i thought Wow, what a coincidence having the same name as Laurence Olivier. And it was only when I got home, I checked, and it's Laurence Olivier's son. Yes. And these are the kind of people you drew together in that room. The dynamic of that room was incredible. And how you and Andrew had brought all those people together was just phenomenal. So can you tell me a little bit about, I'm even fascinated, how you even managed to get all those people in that room at the same time. It's like herding sheep. I mean, how did you manage it? <laughs> Actually, it's more like herding cats, but absolutely. Oh, God. Again, <laughs> dear me, where does my brain take you sometimes? Herding sheep? You can herd sheep. Do it. Yes. <laughs> Maybe I should just shut up and let you talk. <laughs> Please Stop do. the analogies, Tony. Stop the analogies. <laughs> well, it, it's, it was wonderful. I agree very much. So, I mean, to go back, um, about just under two years, about 18 months ago, the cosmic hologram came out and I was invited to launch it at the United Nations in New York so we started to sort of have this sense of inviting people who might be open to its message of, of unified reality and this convergence of sort of science and spirituality as sort of two you know tributaries moving together to a possible integration and a perspective of, of uh, Conscious isn't something we have, it's what we and the whole world are, which again correlates with very ancient understanding. So the book was launched there and then um, by a beautiful range of sort of synchronicities and introductions, I was introduced to Andrew Lord Stowe and I went up to see him at the House of Lords and um, he very kindly offered to launch the book at the House of Lords in London, which we did last July, not last July, but July 2018. 2017 and it's so it was so beautiful something like 90 people in two sessions we just invited them and it was friends of friends people who saw that person looks interesting that person's a change maker that person might be open so it was just this invitation to share and and to explore together and so that really um was the co-founding of, of something called whole world view which we now have a, a, a website for. But that then followed on and the last 18 months since then, I've been literally going around the world with many, many other folks, linking up and lifting up and through serendipitous meetings, through synchronicities. I mean, some of the stories are just unbelievable, but true. And so when we came to last November, um, we invited something like 200. We, we already had a community in the whole world view of some about 500 global change makers after a year and then we invited another further 200 people heads of organizations social activists well you saw the, the sort of the folks who were Absolutely. and they all answered the invitation and so it, it continues to grow and it really is this perspective you know there are there are integral um researchers Ken Wilbur and Dustin De Perma, for example, I talk about this is a time for us to wake up, grow up, clean up, and show up. And I've added two to those, link up and lift up. Because when we're at somewhere in our own journey, I think we get these aha moments, however we've come to that point. And people, I think, are ready for this message. People are ready for this understanding. And 
it's a time that needs it because we can't go on as we have gone on. And this is not just wishful thinking. This is hard empirical evidence and a direction of travel with so much more compelling realization that we literally are all one. And that's not about uniformity. Unity, mm. uniformity. Unity is radical diversity. So I talk about the we and the we. So this is why it feels so exciting. I guess why so many people are just wanting to play, you know, wanting to join the party and wanting to say, how can we serve, you know, how can we help others in this great, potentially global, potentially transformational, potentially evolutionary leap forward as a species? Well, it's so important, isn't it? As the, I, I think long and hard about this as to whether my writing career would have been effective had I begun writing in the 1970s or the 1980s? And the answer is no, because you cannot, A, you cannot network in the same way as you can now, as we're doing now. You cannot link up with people in the same way and you can create such a dynamic egregore, I suppose, of, of, of will around people. And the actual atmosphere in that room was absolutely phenomenal. Everybody was chatting away and everything. And rather like yourself, I mean, I met Andrew Stone around about four or five years ago. And again, he invited me to the, the, the House of Lords and he probably gives you that little guided tour and you go around and you have coffee and tea with him in the, that wonderful tea room. And, and, you know, it was amazing for me because Melvin Bragg was sitting behind yeah. us, you know, and things like that. And I knew that Andrew was this one of these kind of special people who's got the most amazing enthusiasm. He is irrepressible. And, you know, he, he, is, he is the perfect person for this because the time is now right. We have, we can, as you rightly say, we cannot go on like this. And we can't go along with this preoccupation with materialist reductionism and egotism and selfishness and everything else because it's destroying the planet it's destroying our world and we need to move away from religion to spirituality we need to realize that we are all as you say we're all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively and what you're doing there is so important i mean i cannot stress how important it is and everybody if you're interested in checking out jude's website and what this 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 whole unity conference is all about please just join you know check it out join in we need a groundswell here yeah. we need to bypass the kind of the the negative individuals that just think that people like you and i are somehow new age wackos when we're not we're doing the science but we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. you know people do have extraordinary experiences as you rightly said you know it's not an extraordinary experience it's a standard experience and everybody, most people have them and will never, ever talk about them. I mean, I'm thinking Ibn Alexander, for instance, you know, experience. You know, here we have a reductionist person who suddenly has an extraordinary experience and everything changes. Yes. And I think that's key, you know, because I talk about understanding. You know, to understand the, the unified nature of reality is, is a huge, huge important. But actually it's experiencing it and embodying it that's vital, that's vital. And if anybody would like to, to sort of connect, you know, our, our website is www.wholeworld-view.org. And it's still so young, you know, this is a move, but this is a movement that is gaining such incredible traction because we're linking up and lifting up with hundreds and hundreds of other networks and change makers and people who've done their own work and come along their own journey to this point. And there's a real sense now, a real sense of momentum that this is the time to, to do that linking up and lifting up and supporting each other. Do you know what I think was wonderful about the dynamic in that room is that the number of people I spoke to and ordinarily in business meetings, and you and I will know this, when you're networking in business meeting, all people want to do is talk about themselves. They want to say, oh, I work for this organization. We're doing all these incredible things. 
virtually all the time when you got talking to some people were deflecting back well why are you here what do you do and they'd reflect back so there was no kind of egos there it was it was just a kind of a sponge of taking in please talk to me tell me about your ideas and it was i was walking on air for quite a few days afterwards because there are people like me out there i'm not alone because we all beaver away so much on our own but we realize there's so many of us out there and we can make a difference we can and you're the you guys you're the ones that are making it happen you know and the amount of work you must have put into that conference must have been unbelievable and all i say is absolute take my hat off to you i can use that that's a correct analogy isn't it <laughs> i'll take my hat off to you it's uh, it's wonderful okay jude we're getting towards the end of our hour and as usual we've only scratched the surface and i know there's lots of things that you and i need to still chat about because there's such there's so much synergy between what you're doing and i'm doing but if you can um tell a little bit more about well i suppose you've already given the website but you can reiterate the website tell people a little bit about your books where they can find your books and everything else and uh, <laughs> and everything else really <laughs> that's another open question isn't it i expect <laughs> And everything else as well. Everything else. Um, well, the easy thing is that you know the books are all on Amazon, and I've written six, so they're all on Amazon. But if people would like to Google my name and YouTube, um, you'll find it. They'll find a lot. Friends, you'll find a lot of, of. You'll run, but you can't hide from me. There's a lot on YouTube now. But uh, yeah, from Findhorn Talks down to talks with Jeffrey Mishlove of, of New Thinking Aloud to many, many others. Um, so I, I'd love people to go there and then also to go to the whole world hyphen view.org website where they can, and they can join our, our Facebook page. Um, we have a hashtag, we are unity. Um, so there's lots of ways and we'd love to hear from folks and just connect with folks and, and continue to link up and lift up. And you say, thank you, Tony, I really appreciate it, but it's folks like you, it's folks like this, all of us together. It literally is all of us together that can make the difference and invite others in. You know, this is an invitation. So come on, guys, do it. Let's, this is our opportunity. This is, this is our opportunity to really make a change happen. Delighted. Thank you, Dr. Jude Curravan, for an absolutely wonderful conversation. Um, the next Consciousness Hour um, will be a slight change um, in that um, I'm delighted to have as our guest Bill Sarrell. Um, some of you will know of Bill Sarrell, but some of you will not. Bill Sarrell was a very close friend of the American science fiction writer Philip K. Dick. And as you will know, or many of you will know, I wrote the last book on Philip K. Dick. It was published about four years ago. And Bill was one of the guys that worked with Philip K. Dick on a lot of his religious vision and the way in which he saw a Gnostic worldview. And again, the idea of how the world is some form of eminent, eminent and a thought and a great thought, as Julian Jean said. So it's going to be fascinating talking to Bill because I know that he was with Philip K. Dix during some of the most interesting parts of Philip K. Dick's life. So this is going to be a fascinating insight. And as you know, we've already had Tessa Dick on the show many years ago, who was Philip K. Dick's final wife, and she's given us some insights. But Bill is an interesting man in his own right. So let's check in when that one comes out. Um, thanks again, Jude, and I look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Uh, I won't probably be able to get anywhere near you because you always have so many people around you wanting your attention, but I will just wave at a distance. <laughs> Come and say hello and come, let's have a hug. <laughs> okay. And what I'll try and do is try and herd the sheep towards you and the cats away from you or something like that. <laughs> That's so greatly appreciated. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. And thank you to dear too. Okay.